One of the most beloved and enduring subgenres in horror is undoubtedly transformation body horror, and the 80s had some wonderful examples. I was well into my early fascination with horror movies by the mid-80s, and although I was way too young to be, my exposure to the genre was quickly developing. One of the first movies I remember being completely not terrified by, honestly, was An American Werewolf in London, with one scene in particular forever etched into my memory. No, not the shower scene, you sick and twisted gorehounds. It was the legendary transformation scene, overseen by visual effects maestro Rick Baker, that left a lasting impression on this young movie fan. Even today, the scene has it all. Amazing visual effects and makeup, plus the terrifying ordeal that David is going through, is all beautifully realized. This is just one example of body horror from the early 80s. But look a little further into the decade and you'll find many other wonderful transformation scenes. They get hung up on the transformation, which they should, because they're really hard to do a werewolf movie. I mean, they're a bitch to have you buy that wolf. And you want to. That wolf's got to be premium. But um, think about what it says. What's the angst inside it? What's it telling us? about that character inside what's going wrong what's you know where is it but i mean i still love the 30s werewolves you know because there's there's always something cool happening there um you know i love uh, the universal classics because there's just you know there's great actors and there's great cinematography so again they're dignifying the audience However, the likes of An American Werewolf in London are examples of true R-rated horror movies, with scenes as gory as they could get back in the 80s. So while the film we're looking at in this episode is admittedly more of a comedy, it still boasts some horror roots, and a star who is about to break into the stratosphere thanks to Back to the Future. That's right, horror fans, Teen Wolf is very much on the lighter side of the horror genre. But it was a true rite of passage film for this adolescent, especially considering the body horror element. It was exciting to see such a rising star in Michael J. Fox in a movie that not only gave a great werewolf, and yes, that also includes Mr. Harold's somewhat fluffy transformation that wouldn't look out of place in Caravan of Courage. So join us as we surf on the top of the Wolfmobile and make out with our high school best friend in a closet as we look back on the all-time classic, Teen Wolf, on our 80s horror memories. I was hoping it would pass you by. Well, Daddy, it didn't pass me by. It landed on my face. As I'm sure you've already seen on 80s horror memories so far, the 80s were really a golden decade for movies, not just for horror, but also for film in general. Its legacy still lives on today in fashion, as well as TV and movie franchises, and 1985 was no exception. When Teen Wolf was released, we had the fortune of having two movie theaters just a short drive away from our family house. During the school summer breaks, my parents were busy working, so from time to time, my grandmother would take me to the nearest cinema to see whatever the early screening would be. Or if it were a weekend, I'd be whisked off to a Saturday matinee, pockets full of sweets from the nearest convenience store, as grandma would always bemoan just how expensive the concessions were back then. What a fucking liberty! And this was the 80s we're talking about, so times must have been hard, even then. We'd see movies such as the Tom Cruise adventure, Legend, The Goonies, and of course, Back to the Future. However, she drew the line at sneaking us in to see Friday the 13th, A New Beginning. Come on, Gran. I thought you were cooler than that. The experience of going to the cinema back then was different from how it is now. There was an interval where ushers would sell ice cream down the aisles. And of course, no idiots were texting or Snapchatting during the performance. Happy times. 
Before we could see Teen Wolf, Michael J. Fox's other, more significant franchise, Back to the Future, had already been in theaters for seven weeks. Allowing his wolf-out comedy to ride the coattails of the time travel juggernaut perfectly. Looking back on Teen Wolf for this episode, it's clearly a movie that exists to entertain and leave you with a big ol' hairy grin on your face afterward. And it more or less manages to do so. She's right. You are an animal. Ah! Let's also not forget that the family-friendly horror comedy genre can be massively hit or miss. Just look at the fun but admittedly subpar entries such as My Mom's a Werewolf, My Best Friend is a Vampire, Wicked Stepmother. However, the 80s did bring us some pretty decent horror movies that were mostly suitable for young, impressionable horror fiends like me. Gremlins, of course, stands proudly at the top of the kid-friendly horror list, but titles like The Monster Squad, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, and The Critter series also provided awesome entertainment value. Well, you know, thinking about it, there were certain scenes in Critters that my folks probably would have objected to me seeing if they knew what dodgy VHS tapes I had acquired for the weekend. However, Gremlins and Critters aside, Teen Wolf was one of the movies from the 80s that really connected with me. Not only for kicks, but as a burgeoning adolescent learning about life. Its themes of youth, self-discovery, puberty, and being one of the outsiders in high school really connected with me. And while the movie concept wasn't anything particularly new, it struck a chord with me big time. In fact, you could actually argue that Teen Wolf took a few creative liberties from Larry Cohen's 1981 comedy, Full Moon High, in which a high school football player becomes a werewolf after a trip to Romania, and he struggles to come to terms with his new reality. Sound familiar? Just swap Romania for hereditary wolf outs, and that's the plot of Teen Wolf right there. What that rather average movie didn't have going for it, however, was a star with massive worldwide appeal. You see, long before any of the more recent big or small screen werewolves leaped onto our screens, there was another hairy young lupine, Scott Howard, who broke our hearts and slam dunked baskets for fun. And as we all know, Michael J. Fox was already a household name thanks to his role in Family Ties. But it was really the back-to-back -back release of Back to the Future and Teen Wolf that really shot him to fame. While the movie has many elements that make it such an entertaining horror spin-off, it's really Fox's performance in the title role that sells the movie. While Michael J. Fox lent his rising star power to the movie, it's fair to say that a lot of the cult appeal of the movie has been basically down to being a formulaic coming-of-age high school movie that doesn't allow its admittedly ridiculous plot twist from getting in the way of its tried and trusted non-horror premise. Overall, Teen Wolf probably had more in common with teen comedies from the era than the likes of an American werewolf in London but that made it way more accessible for its target demographic than if producers had gone for violence over shits and giggles. The movie's development was co-written by Jeff Loeb, who has since produced TV shows like Lost, Smallville, and Heroes, and as an executive vice president of Marvel Television. So you can clearly see a pattern in his subsequent work, with the aforementioned production sticking to a similar central premise the story of Teen Wolf follows Fox's teenage character, Scott, who lives with his furry-faced dad in an idyllic American suburb, with all of the stereotypical traits that come with the setting. He's got the picket fences, the best friend who thinks he's cool as fuck, the female best friend who is cool as fuck, just Scott doesn't realize it yet. Plus, all of the social anxieties that go hand in hand with being a teenager. We can probably all relate to this, apart from the life-altering lupine abilities, that is. I'm pretty sure that's not a thing, right? Scott is part of the high school basketball team and is smitten with the untouchable hot blonde cheerleader type who'd rather date dudes with eyebrows almost as hairy as our werewolf protagonist than hang out with Scott. 
After a night out at a party, in which he gets a little too rough while making out with his best friend Boof in a closet, he returns home and promptly undergoes a rather strange transformation. This goes far beyond simple growing pains, as Scott experiences his first transformation as a werewolf. Speaking of laughter and comedies, Teen Wolf was, uh, was a, a delightful watch for me. Um, most, well, I, I was a big fan of Michael J. Fox, as we all were and are. Um, and something about his brand of comedy and his reactionary comedy uh, works so well for me. So here he was, this teenage kid, uh, with things happening to him that we could all relate to, sort of, because that's an era of puberty has hit all of us. We go through changes, it's like, what's happening to me? I'm, I feel different, I look different, I smell different, <laughs> right? And then, you, so, but add to that, uh, make that, uh, turn up the volume on that a bit, and you've got Michael J. Fox going through his transformation into a werewolf and not one, wondering what the heck happened. One, one of my, the visuals that I can't get out of my head is when he was changing in a locker room and he noticed this long couple of hairs coming out of his chest that were like this long. And he's like, oh, ha, ha, and he, how much that hurt. So I, I, it was a throwback that we can all relate to, like things are happening, things are growing, and, but, but that was quite fantastical and, and you know, boating of things to come for him. Although the werewolf is one of the most classic monsters in all of horror, it historically didn't have quite the same appeal as similar characters such as Dracula and Frankenstein, plus it didn't have the same literary background to mine from. However, their origins go much further back than some of the other classic universal monsters to European folklore's rich and strange narratives. Legend has it that these fearsome creatures are humans who turn into savage wolves each time there is a full moon, either by way of curse, a bite, or even by choice. This transformative act has proven to be rich in symbolic resonance. It can suggest the return of the modern human to the more primitive animalistic form and the physical manifestation of the primal beast hidden within us all. In Teen Wolf, Scott's transformation doesn't find himself roaming the countryside feeding on the weak, nor does he seek human flesh in his own suburban setting. On the contrary, his transformation sees him becoming a hairy, much shorter Michael Jordan, who gets the hot blonde cheerleader type while using his teeth to open beer cans, without much violence seen in between. It's in Scott's transformation scene, and all of the hints that his wolf out is imminent, that we really get to the core of the movie's leanings towards the horror genre. Relatively near the movie's beginning, Scott begins to sprout long hairs and scores a keg of beer from a reluctant storekeeper with his red wolf eyes and intimidating growl. After seeing this scene, I remember thinking how cool it would be to nip over to my local convenience store on my skateboard and coerce the shopkeeper into selling me beer by the way of scary eyes and a gravelly voice. I never tried, mainly because Big Bro was pretty good at acquiring booze back then without the need for wolf intimidation to help him out. Thanks, bro. Did you or did you not distribute alcohol and marijuana to minors? No, Your Honor, I did not. Told you this defendant wasn't cool. Well, no, 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 hold on a minute. The transformation scene itself lingered long in my memory, and looking back on it for this retrospective, it still has that cool 80s charm about it. The VFX is pretty neat for the era, and although Michael J. Fox's face looks a tad rubbery as he's contorting into his werewolf form, it's still a fun, if humorous, sequence. His overall werewolf form isn't the most realistic look, but that's not really worth being critical of in a film of this nature. The wolf out concept is absurd in itself, so the fact that Fox's wolf form looks a tad silly isn't really an issue. While Teen Wolf definitely struck a chord with me for its aforementioned themes, it has many more attributes that take me right back to being a young, aspirational gorehound each time I managed to catch this movie again. Daniel's other most prominent movies I was aware of in the 80s were the likes of K-9 from 1989, 
so it wasn't his influence as a director that guided and influenced me. Rather, I remember the movie's overall cast and notable sequences with such fondness after all these years. I thought Scott's best friend Styles was hilarious, with humor well matched by the quote-laden t-shirts that he wore and funny merchandise he peddles for Scott post-Wolfout. His other best friend and ultimate love interest, Boof, also caught my attention, probably more than the traditionally hot blonde cheerleader did. And despite knowing that they would end up together, their relationship is partly what makes this movie work so well. In terms of supporting characters, we also get Scott's Ewok-like dad, whose appearance makes me laugh just as much now as it did back in the day. He gets a great scene late in the movie where he confronts his former tormentor, Vice Principal Thorn, making Rusty piss himself in the process. There are also many other characters that linger long in the memory. Jay Tars' coach Finstock, as well as Scott's basketball team with Mark Holton's Chubby, a standout. However, while these characters are all well-written and memorable, and add their own qualities to the story, they fit in with the requisite template of such a movie. This isn't a criticism, far from it. As although the movie has its flaws, it still has enough sequences that render it a classic in the eyes of this movie fan. The basketball scenes may be a tad drawn out and unspectacular, but they're fun. And you still have that euphoric moment when non-wolf Scott helps his team win the championship game against all odds. Is it predictable? Of course, but that's not the point. It's the perfect ending for a movie that revels in showing a teen werewolf surfing his own wolf mobile, tearing around the basketball like a badass and ultimately turning down the hot cheerleader for his true best friend and most likely future spouse. The movie spoke to me on many levels as a young person, and although it's flawed, that doesn't stop it from being such an important part of my movie-watching adolescence. If you haven't seen the movie, comb back that awesome mullet, whack on your favorite Dayglow tank top, and rock out with your fangs out while sinking your wolf teeth into a beer or two. However, if you've seen the movie, then what's your take on it? Does it stack up as a horror comedy? Should it be kept in that kid-friendly family comedy genre? And does it hold up as a classic movie in its own right? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. These waves are mine. On the next episode, take a trip with us down to the lab to meet Dr. Herbert West, a man with a good head on his shoulders, and another on a dish on his desk. Until next time, gore hounds. Hi friends, your humble narrator Tyler Nichols here, and I hope that you enjoyed that episode of 80s Horror Memories. If you missed our previous episode, click over here. If you want to see more from our series, click up here. And if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? Subscribe right here. And most importantly, stay spooky, folks.